<laughs> welcome to our very first uh, climate summit. Uh, also, welcome to the people joining over Zoom. We have some lost people joining in the MV. Welcome. Um, this is the very first time we organize a climate summit here at INSEAD. It's a partnership with, between the Environment and Business Club and the Hoffman Institute. Um, and the goal of this is to uh, bring more sustainability to INSEAD and also to show how uh, also traditional companies are now moving towards more sustainable work. Uh, so we're very happy that so many people joined, both in person and over Zoom. Uh, we will be looking at uh, uh, several uh, topics today. First, uh, Katel, who I will introduce uh, in a bit, uh, will talk uh, more about uh, what academia is doing in the, uh, in the energy transition, how it links with the role of INSEAD and the Hoffman Institute. Then we will have uh, Julian Kritschloff from uh, Bain, who will uh, uh, will uh, also talk about their work, uh, has also a very long experience uh, in energy. We will have uh, Francesco Bellini from BCG, and then online, uh, Laura uh, Segafredo, uh, who is uh, who has a PhD and works currently at BlackRock, will uh, join to talk a bit also about the science uh, behind climate change. We will introduce each speaker uh, more in detail uh, right before they start. Um, so it will be four blocks of 30 minutes each. Um, so always starting with the speaker presenting their topic, and at the end, we will have a QA. Uh, for the people in the room, you will just be able to raise your hand and ask your question. For people over Zoom, um, actually, I hope you all hear me well. Um, so, people over Zoom, you can just uh, put your questions in the chat, and then I will uh, ask them to the speaker. So, uh, maybe I'm not sure whether I told my name. So, I'm Matthias, uh, co president of the Environment and Business Club. We also have some other of our uh, members here. Uh, so, also in general, after this event, if there's anything you want to do around sustainability at INSEAD, uh, feel free to reach out to us. So then let me introduce uh, Katel Le Boulevet. Um, she is, uh, well, the head of the Hoffman Institute also was there right when it was founded a couple of years ago. Um, and as I said, she will be talking about uh, the role of INSEAD and the Hoffman Institute in, uh, in research, in, uh, in networking on um, on sustainability, uh, with engaging with business on sustainability, and also very importantly with students and alumni. The floor is yours. Thank you. Hi. Thanks so much for uh, organizing this, uh, this event. Because Trisha, I think, is online and the club. Uh, it's launch week, or second launch <coughs> week for the students who just come on campus. And the reason why this is organized now is that. This club and us at the Hoffman Institute believe that these are the topics we should be talking about at launch week. <laughs> so I guess as uh, maybe you didn't really have that, you felt it was important to provide it to, uh, to the next cohort coming on campus. So, so thanks. Thanks for, do, thanks for doing that. Anna, I think you have my slide and you, you're controlling them from there, right? You can go ahead, that'd be great. So uh, I wanted to welcome all the new students. I'm not too sure who's here, but I think we have to welcome the 23 J's, the MBAs. Oh, did they you go well? What's the one coming? The MIMS 2023. Okay. Well, so they're online. They're online. Or they have class. And we also, uh, I think, welcoming the GameBat 24. Yes. We have okay. one. <laughs> They're mostly uh, on the Asia campus, I think. No, I'm 23. Oh, so well, thanks for coming. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Not too late. Not too late. Thanks for joining us. Um, so, oh, I, I think there is some webinar etiquette. Am I supposed to do that? Well, let me do this. For those who are online, then uh, to keep your video off, mute yourself, etc. Use the chat box for questions. <laughs> that was the answer to, to what you'll be moderating here later, Matisse. So thanks. Um, so I thought, yeah, I'm supposed to talk about what we do at the Hoffman Institute, but I thought I'll talk about nature. i take a few minutes for nature, if that's okay with everybody. Um, I know it's a climate summit, but I was uh, discussing last week, we are putting together some context, context uh, content on nature positive for the INSEAD new learning hub. And I was discussing last week with uh, Carl Folk, who is the head of the Stockholm Resilience Center was a uh, co-founder of that center. He's, uh, he's a scientist who's been working at the intersection of ecology and society for his whole career. And he's, he's one of the most cited scientists and academics, in fact, across discipline. So he's in that, you know, deep um, all day, and that's been happening to him for, for decades. And he's 
I found him in the conversation to be much more optimistic than I was. And so I was asking um, why that was so. And he said, well, Ketel, you know, it's already super exciting that we actually can have this conversation. If you think about it and you think about the universe, right? Um, there are at least, you know, uh, at least as we know it, two trillion galaxies in the universe. Um, one of these galaxy hours has uh, from 100 to 400, I think it is, billion stars. Uh, and uh, one of these stars uh, is our sun uh, that has eight planets orbiting around it. I think I get this number okay, but might not have uh, them perfectly. <laughs> yeah. And um, Earth has the biosphere, which is uh, a layer of only 12 miles where you can actually find life all over this huge whole system. And that's what was getting him excited. The fact that actually the fact that we had could have a conversation, discuss and operate in that super thin layer was something that was uh, making him um, enthused. So I think my next slide, uh, Anna, which is also coming from him, which is that I think which is important to remember that in fact, the place where human and human activities can operate is super small, 12 miles, 20 kilometers where we actually have a complex web of natural system that jointly provide the conditions of us being here. And he was like, make sure you always tell everybody who you speak to, remind them of that. We need to frame large, etc." And I don't do it as much as I should, but I think it's important because pretty much everything else depends on that. Now, the work that he's done together with all these uh, scientists looking at ecology, at looking at the science of the biosphere, have basically, and I know I'm going to caricature here quite a bit, um, but they're basically three main conclusions of their work, right? The first one is that, and that's the next slide, Anna, please. The first one is that the condition of the biosphere are pretty much made possible by nine systems, again, that are interwoven and that make things work naturally, <laughs> my words, so that we can be here, right? And we also tend to forget that. These nine systems are connected to the ocean, the land, uh, the system of fresh water, biodiversity, our climate system, and some geochemical systems as well, right? So basically, the, all the scientists on the planet have spent a lot of time to see what mattered for life on Earth in the biosphere to uh, be possible and rather stable. And these are these nine different processes or system or however you want to call them, right? So that's the first big uh, findings of these scientists. Next slide, Anna, please. The second big finding is that today, humans are the main driving force influencing how these systems work, right? Typically, it's been regulated through natural phenomenon. Today, we are in the driver's seat. And you can you have tons of image and symbols to actually talk about that, right? Here is there was a super, I don't know if you've seen that article, super interesting, basically evaluating all the biomass on Earth and then looking per species what we had. And this is a slide related to mammals. So if you look at the biomass of all mammals on the planet, 36% is us. This is getting bigger, both because we're getting bigger and because also <laughs> human population is growing, right? Then 60% of that is livestock we produce for our food. And then we have 4% of wildlife. So nature out of the overall <laughs> biomass on the planet today is 4%, if you look at mammals. You can find the same numbers with birds, out of which 70% will be poultry and 30%, you know, wild birds, etc. right? So you can go through that, but that's one illustration on how basically uh, humans are, is, are the most driving force of changing this web of natural systems. Another one, next slide, Anand, please, same thing. So again, we can go through that, but human activity today influence 75% of ice-free land uh, on the planet, etc. right? You can go through that and look at all these nine elements and see that basically today human is the main driving force. second findings. The third finding, next slide, Anna, please, is that since 1950, 
human activity on Earth has accelerated to a point that we are basically putting this natural system out of whack. Okay, so you've seen that, you've heard that for climate here, obviously is the, the illustration for global warming. But, but what's interesting is that that applies across all these nine systems. And, um, and uh, here, I think it's, it's the latest IPCC reports, which actually put things in a graphic manner that is, quite, that is quite telling. What you see is that global warming on the planet has been uh, maintained in some kind of a stable uh, uh, a spectrum for not just decades, not just centuries, but for really uh, uh, um, uh, hundreds of thousands of, of years be before us. And that what's happened is, since the 1950s, due to um, population growth and industrialization, has completely accelerated uh, changes here. And what you see on the on the right hand uh, graph, is that the right hand for you? Yeah, is that uh, they've simulated how natural fluctuation would have influenced the temperature, so below on green. And if you uh, bring together human and natural um, uh, influence on global warming, then this is when you see it taking off. Okay, you all know that story, but the point is that this is their third factor finding in terms of we have entered since the 50s an acceleration phase. So um, the reason why I wanted to talk about that, Anna, can you go back to the to two slides back? No, not that, that's after, that's also very important. <laughs> uh, the one before, thanks Anna, she's, she's handling the, in our team, handling the, the webinar online. So basically what you see here, and you know, it's a classic drawing of the planetary boundary. It has evolved. That's the that's the seminal working piece published later in 2009, but in 2015, more scientists came together to evaluate when it is that we've crossed some threatening level around these nine subsystems that basically threaten uh, uh, life in the, in, the, in the biosphere. So, should we be worried? Yes, this is in red, so that means get worried. Uh, is there anything we can do? Also, yes. And the main important point in my conversation with Carl, what he was saying, you know, we've never been as influential as we are today to be able to change something, and obviously for good or for bad, right? So uh, now if you can come back to my green slide, that was four slides back. So I should have a clicker, but I don't, so it becomes a little complicated in terms of the instructions. So the main point here is that, yes, thanks, Anna, that's this one. The main point here is that no human activity, business, or whatever you want to do today can really put um, uh, ignore the fact that human activity and natural system are intertwined. And I think that's very important, and that's why we should be talking about that uh, in the first week or second week in the business school, is because this is a fact, this is a framer, and this is the premises of everything we do. This means that the nature, climate, and environmental, however you want to call it, agenda is not a sideshow, right? It's not something that we... Uh, that we think of exposed or we adjust at the margin, but it's really core business. We'll hear from our great speakers today that uh, there is no uh, company in uh, uh, today, whatever the industry is, which cannot take into account the risk associated with climate change uh, from you know, whatever they are. You cannot today build a warehouse without taking into account increased uh, intensity and frequency of floods, drought, heat waves, Landslides, name it, right? We've all seen it, including in France and in Germany. So very close to home for those who are Europeans. Um, it means also that the, um, the relevance of any organization, take any business, take INSEAD, is also increasingly connected to integrating uh, uh, this agenda because increasingly clients, consumers, uh, everybody asks and looks. And it also means that there are business opportunities in, uh, in looking and integrating uh, nature and, uh, and climate uh, variability in businesses. And I think we'll be hearing from that as well. Um, we, can, we will hear mostly from climate, but uh, with Fran Francesco on, at BCG also we uh, partnered on a study on, on biodiversity, making the same kind of case. So my point here was really to show you that beyond climate, we pretty much have uh, an overall natural um, 
uh, web, foundational web that we need to consider. Okay, core business, core business and for insight. So what are we doing? Next slide, and, uh, um, Anna, please. Uh, we'll discuss that also with the other speakers in details, but basically the answer is like, we're talking about it a lot, maybe not here enough, uh, but we're talking about it a lot. We're doing much less and we could do much more, okay? Uh, in Glasgow uh, last year, and we have some uh, influential guest speaker who can give all the details. Um, most countries uh, made uh, uh, pledges uh, uh, on uh, redu reduction their, their greenhouse gases. The climate action uh, tracker has done a good job, I think, I don't know if you would agree, at really disaggregating all this, putting it together and see what that would lead us to by the end of the century if all of these were to be implemented. And we are between 2.5 plus 2.5 degree if the targets are met um, to 2.7 degrees, I think, if uh, we keep the current policies in place. With 2.4 degrees by the end of the century, and already from now to 2030 on that path, two to three billion people on the planet have their livelihoods threatened. So we could think, okay, it's not here in Fontainebleau, so it could be okay, right? But basically it's coming. So I think these are the numbers we're talking about, one to three billion people's livelihood. And these are gonna be your workers in your supply chains. They're gonna be your employees in your multinationals. And they're going to be your colleagues, friends, uh, etc. Right? So it's not that distance in space and in time. Uh, next slide, Anna, please. So that's at the country level, providing the overall regulatory framework and the incentives. If we look at businesses, and here you're going to uh, uh, hear much more about this as well, a lot of pledges have been made. Right? I mean, the net zero list, uh, the net zero pledge list is in, in, uh, has been growing by the day. Oh. Here, same thing, an interesting, uh, uh, really nitty gritty uh, uh, evaluation that was made by the car uh, Carbon Market uh, Watch. They look at the 20, 25 biggest firms with a pledge. And it's really interesting a report to look, they have great graphs, you don't have to read it, you just look at two, three graphs. And they show that basically only half of them have actual targets to get to meet these pledges. They show that there is only one out of these 25, which is considering its supply chain in its scope three to do something, blah, 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 right? So basically, if you put together what these 25 biggest mm -hmm. firms have committed to do on paper, you would only reduce their emission by 40%, which is far from the net zero. However, you wanna tweak that for your PR purposes or if you genuinely mean it, okay? So same thing, a lot to still do there. Next slide, Anna, please. So the same way that uh, this, all this should become core in business, at INSEAD, it should also core, uh, become core. If it's not core in business education, then you wonder how it can become core in business. So that's a little bit of the theory of change behind that. You would have heard coming here, business at the first for good at the motto that our dean, our board uh, are pushing. So at the Hoffman Institute, our objective is to try to support that vision by integrating sustainability into everything that INSEAD does, okay? So um, we were created thanks to a, a large foundation, a large, not foundation, a large donation from uh, an INSEAD alum, Andre Hoffman and his wife, Rosalie, with the view to do that. What is important that you keep in mind when you come, and many of us, of you have already come to us saying like, well, how come we don't have, it's like academia, is just something that changes very slowly. We have Lucy Tepla, we have one of our faculty member, I'm putting you on the spot, who's here. Changing fast. She can, <laughs> she can testify to it, she's here, and we should be super thankful because some are trailblazers, Lucy is in that. But in general, across academia in the world, like academia is just changing uh, slow, right? If you look at the, just a time frame of research um, uh, and public peer-reviewed publication, if you look at that process, you already see that this is just slow change uh, uh, organ, uh, uh, system. And um, yeah, okay, you can put it back. Uh, you can put it back to our strategy, Anna, please, the next slide. Uh, and so that's true across the board, uh, not just, not just at, at, uh, at INSEAD. So I just wanted to mention that because this is something that is important and uh, 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 something to consider. However, if you think that INSEAD puts on the market 1,000 MBA, we just take the MBA because the majority of you, on the market a year, 
that you will go back to a lot of countries because none of you stay to work here in Fontainebleau, I have to say. <laughs> it's very rare. And that the INSEAD alumni community, 60,000 alumni in 175 countries, changing something at INSEAD can really change how business is uh, led and is uh, uh, influencing this agenda in the world. Right? So that's uh, that's the, that's uh, our main objective. So Anna, please, can you put the next slide? So our strategy basically covers everything that INSEAD does, i.e. its production of knowledge. So we fund research uh, that has to do with business and society. We fund cases also that look at these issues. The interest here is not really in terms of KPI, the amount we give, or well, the number of faculty, the number of faculty is important, but what's important is that as of today, there are faculty members in every academic area of INSEAD working on that topic. That's what matters. There are nine academic areas. Uh, that's how things are uh, sectorialized in uh, business education. And at INSEAD, you will find at least one or two and more and more faculty working in these topics. Why invest in research when we need to change the world now? It is just so slow. Well, because this is basically what's going to advise uh, governments, that's what's going to advise uh, decision makers in businesses all over the world, and that's also what trickles down in the classroom eventually to, uh, to, to teach you, right? So that's the first pillar of what we do. Then the learning part is super important. Uh, here again, uh, you will see, and Kim, I think, is here in the back, is working with the faculty committee to look at, take a broad view of the current curriculum and in particular core courses and how to integrate further in core courses. Right now, your experience as uh, just newcomers now will be that this is happening in a little bit of an ad hoc way in core courses, but next cohort will have that done in a more integrated and institutional way. Now, the number of electives that you have access to is increasing on these topics. Again, sustainable finance, Lucy is here, she's teaching it now, uh, one you want to put uh, on your box. So this number is, is also increasing. The key question now for the school is to say, is this something we talk about it at the end of the learning journey, or do we bring some of it at the beginning, again, as a framer, right? If we think that that matters, and obviously our answer is yes, but faculty member or will, uh, will be deciding on how to do that. So the question of doing it is not a question anymore, I would say, it's how we do it. You can also learn beyond the classroom. This is why the clubs are here. You have the business and environmental club, but there are many other clubs today uh, organizing event in conversation on this topic. The, one of the last one we had on the energy transition was the energy club, right? You're here. Who's here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's here? You're here. Yeah. So we, uh, we brought uh, uh, Jankovici to talk about it. And you know how he is. He shook the room a little bit in terms of like, what are you guys doing here? Anyway, so you can watch that. It's on, it's on the, it's online. But I think, you know, it's no more, again, the remit of one club, the same way that it's not the remit of one institute or one part of the firm. Same thing. Anyway, we also fund internship. We, have, we support treks. We support mm -hmm. events. Blah, blah, blah. Whatever you want to do on that, go through your club to us. We're here to help with that. The third part of our uh, strategy is around engagement. Here, an important uh, part of our engagement is with our alumni community, again, providing lifelong learning on these topics. Um, uh, there is a community impact challenge that I co-founded, uh, but is now fully led by alumni volunteers doing a good job at that, that you can already join and see how they're pushing for alumni in their company to move to net zero. But we're also engaging with external partners, uh, like going to the web to bring some knowledge from our faculty to engage in this conversation with the latest evidence coming from INSEAD research. And finally, walk the talk. So typically that's what you see when you come, right? And what you feel is also not moving enough. You've seen the, the inside commitment on uh, scope one and two, not enough, we agree. Now, uh, but that's the first step for the school. The trade-offs here is super important because the reason why you came to INSEAD is probably because, of course, it's one of the best schools, but it's also because it's so diverse in terms of who you have in the classroom with you, right? We have now in your cohort 80 different nationalities. For INSEAD to offer that on several campuses, well, you're going to have to fly, right? So how do we reconcile that with a carbon footprint? <laughs> Something that others are struggling with, but that's part of really questioning core business of INSEAD when we start looking at school three. Maria is here. She can talk to you more about uh, what the school is doing on Scope 3. Um, Lucy can also talk about what INSEAD did in terms of how it invests its endowment. 
right? So all the bits and pieces of how we operate are there. But again, I would say that that's great, but climate change won't be effective in, in SEAD reduce or not its carbon footprint, sorry to say. Huh? We would have a stronger impact on climate change if we change our, uh, our way of teaching and what you leave equipped with to make change in your companies, right? So while this is important, what's mostly important for you to engage on if you want to actively put that agenda in the school is on the teaching. Okay, I, I'm probably spoken too long, yeah? Okay, so two <laughs> last slides. <laughs> two last slides, super quick, because they also said, tell the students what they can do. So next slide, Anna, please. What you can do first, educate yourself. Educate yourself on the complexity of the earth systems and the biosphere. It's fascinating. We're gonna be putting some of this contact online, a content online with you. We are curating now with Isabel was here. She can also talk about it. Some content with the Capital Coalition, the WEF, the Stockholm Resilience Center, uh, and I'm forgetting more. System. And Systemic also, you know, we're putting some content together and we hope that maybe some of you will join, putting some content about to educate yourself on that resilience, planetary boundary and the Anthropocene. So educate yourself what you hear. Question your educators, okay? <laughs> when you have presented some models that might be dating back from the 80s, ask. I think these are important conversations. And maybe not everybody is equipped. I certainly am not, but at least ask so that the conversation is generated in the classroom. I think that's important. And finally, optimize your learning options. I think you might be presenting the list of electives you can take. We also have that. Again, if there is something you're not finding here, you can come to us and we can try to set it up for you. But you know, while you're here, it's time for learning. So just try to optimize that in that direction, if I may. Last, my final slide is about, well, you've already about to graduate or leave. What do you do? Are oh, you an alumni? So the first, my always first recommendation is like, don't quit your job, right? So it's always like, oh, you work at UNICEF, it'd be so good for me to help children. I'm like, no, no, they, you know, where you can have the most impact is in the industry that you know, where you seasoned, when you have your thing. And if there is not much happening there, this is why they need you, right? So uh, I think that's very important. And I would tie to that, don't look frantically for the sustainability job. There are not that many. And typically the sustainability team in a company, and you can uh, debunk all that when you speak after, because maybe I'm wrong. It's going to be an internal advisory group, right? But as an individual, there is a lot you can do in ops. Everything connected to supply chains where 90% of the emissions are is where you can really make a difference, right? So don't focus on the sustainability job tag thing, right? Uh, find nature in your portfolio and then assess to meet transform this close. This is what we're gonna be talking about. Everybody can have an impact at that level, clearly. So uh, that's what we try to do at the Hoffman Institute for, for, uh, for INSEAD. So with that, I'm gonna close here. We hear all the members of the Hoffman Institute team are here, raise your hand, come to us to talk about uh, anything that you want to do. And um, welcome again, and over to you, Patrice. Thanks. Uh, we are a bit behind, but maybe quick one question. Um, does Hoffman help in any way in case you want to go to COP27? Alors, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is no. You can also provide an answer in terms of the relevance and the impact of this. This is state, yeah. Um, why? <laughs> why would you like to go to COP27? It's where everyone's coming for purposes. Well, I agree. So I've worked in, uh, in the UN for uh, over a decade in my professional career. These big events matter, uh, I would say, because that's the place where governments come together. But otherwise, uh, these typically are, I mean, I think it matters. Don't get me, yeah, I'm, I shouldn't say what I want to say. Um, <laughs> these are big circuses, uh, you know, and are growing in size. And I think the question to ask ourselves is like, where can we have the most impact, including as an individual? And, and how, right? The truth is that uh, uh, we went last year for COP26 because we launched uh, INSEAD together with the seven other large European business schools. We launched an initiative where we're trying to put some of our content on climate together for our alumni community. So we had something to announce and to do. I don't know. This year, I think as an organization, we probably will not be there. Um, but I think the question to ask is, you know, what for? I'm going to leave it at that, and maybe you'll have more politically correct answers after. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, no. 
I can, I can have a chat with you after. <laughs> Thank you, Katel. And I'm pretty sure that uh, all students here and even alumni can uh, contact the Hoffman Institute yeah. uh, with any further questions or if they want mm -hmm. to engage on specific projects like this. Now we will be moving to our uh, next speaker, uh, Julian. Uh, uh, yes, please do so. Uh, Julian uh, Critchlow, Critchlow, Critchlow. Um, who has uh, worked for the UK government on uh, their net zero work, but even more importantly, for Bay, he's in uh, uh, advisory board. Uh, you have a lot of experience with uh, utilities in the energy industry. Now we will be talking about the role of uh, public markets in the energy transition. Thanks a lot for being here. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Let me start by just giving you the reason why I'm here and why I'm speaking on the subject, because uh, it's very personal. I, I joined Bain 35 years ago. I spent the last 11 years of my career running the global utilities and alternative energy practice for Bain, and therefore the carbon and energy transition was a very, very important topic for me. But about four years ago, the UK government uh, came and uh, knocked on the door and headhunted me, so I retired from Bain, and I went across to the UK government to run all of the climate action domestically, and all of the interactions with the UNF Triple C on the international negotiations. And obviously, part of that was legislating for net zero, part of that was developing the plans and the governance uh, for the country, uh, but also the decision to bid for COP26 and then host it uh, um, at the end of last year. So um, I kind of like to say that my uh, client focus moved to a, a client with about $5 trillion under assets under management and about 33 million employees, which was the UK uh, as a nation. And so what I'm going to talk about is um, a little bit of the kind of lessons you get from a business perspective also applied to a national perspective. And I'm going to try and cover three uh, topics. First, the energy transition is, is not just happening, it's beyond the Tiffany. So it really is something where you are going to have to consider it as your career, whatever your career, wherever it takes you. Secondly, it's a very important part of ESG. There are lots of factors within ESG, but it actually today is probably the, the number one issue, and I'll give you some data to talk about that. And then thirdly, I'm going to talk about how businesses and countries need to think about the transition. Uh, and can, is this a whole new set of rules that we need to learn, or is it just the old rules applied to another turbulent transition? So let me um, cover that. I've got a whole load of... Um, data because I'm a consultant and uh, you're a yet, so I thought you might enjoy it. Um, so let's see if I get this to work. Okay. Now, now it's going to work. So, firstly, the energy transition is happening. Okay, so um, though I've very much resonated with a lot of the, uh, the discussion in the first session, you know, pre Paris back in 2015, the world was heading for a very, very rhythmic uh, set of trends to weigh maybe four to five degrees. And what we saw through Paris was a, an ambition for countries to drop. Uh, carbon emissions immediately, halve it by 2030, net zero by 2050, and that would keep us below one and a half degrees. Now, just reflect, we are at 1.1 degrees, as the graph shown earlier shows. All of the uh, changes that we've noticed has been the last half degree, and that has been all of the extreme events. You've had 40 degree temperatures in the UK. I can tell you, being British, that we don't get that very often. <laughs> this is definitely an extreme event. And this is obviously going to have cataclysmic effects, but that's half a degree. Even if we went to 2.5 degree, that's another, another three, four, five half degrees. And it's not linear, it's exponential. So all the pledges, if you look at all the different pledges and you combine them, you can take various different scenarios. You can look at all the business pledges. Generally, you'd say maybe 2.4 to 2.7 is a kind of conservative range, but a, if you add up all the commitments that were made at COP26, you could probably argue that it's down to 2.1, really optimistic 1.8, but you're still, still a couple of degrees, or a couple of half degrees um, above uh, where we are today. So given that context, you think, well, okay, we need to change that. We can't, we have to get down to that uh, Paris uh, line. 
And when you look at where the carbon is coming from, it comes from everywhere in the economy. It's not just that purple slither in the middle, which is the energy and utilities, my sector for the, the um, most of my career. It's in industry, it's in the products that we make, the iron and the steel, the building products, the construction, all the housing we make. It's actually in heating and cooling those buildings, a very significant sliver. It's transport, it's moving around locally, it's moving around all the goods in our supply chains and the shipping, it's the aviation. Um, and it's the agriculture, it's all the products that we uh, um, consume. So the whole economy is based on energy. If you change the energy system, you repipe the entire economy. So what's the impact of repiping it? Well, if you look at the sector that I know best, the European utility sector, in around 2009, Europe decided to move its energy system. It put a lot of renewables on, 30% of renewables onto the system. What did that do? It wiped out half the value of my clients at the time. Okay, so that was pretty cataclysmic. And we were asking the question with the World Economic Forum, if he does that in you know, six years, what's he going to do in the next six years? Are we going to go to you know, having zero? And if you have zero value in those investors, they won't invest in the transition. So it's a very important issue. Now, all of those incumbent uh, companies have reconfigured. So today you'll see that they've recovered a lot of that value. But also, interesting, you've seen new businesses emerge, Orsted, Ersted, which was originally Dong Energy. Come back to that in a second, but that's a, a big, very significant business that has emerged in this transition. So turbulence creates winners and losers. You see the same in automotive. If you look at 2014 and you go to 2018, you see the automotive sector before COVID was down about 20% globally from the top manufacturers. But if you then look at what happened to the 21, you see a bit of transformation in the sector. Okay, so Tesla now is worth the same as the top 10 global automotive manufacturers. And that, if you don't, you don't see that kind of turbulence, you have to see what's happening. Why is that happening? You have to ask yourself, the energy sector and the transport sector are the first two sectors to be hit. Those are the first two dominoes that began to fall. So, I mean, Ursid itself, it went from a fossil fuel business, it went to a offshore wind company. It's the largest offshore wind company. Its share price reflects this huge business that they've built. It's a massive success story in offshore wind, one of the, the largest uh, um, provider of offshore wind. A lot of that builds off the North Sea. So, you know, the UK does around 48% of the total offshore wind now, and we're projecting to put another 40 gigs on top of the 10 gigs we've got. So we're going to do in the next 10 years. So that's going to be four times what we just did uh, just in the next 10 years. If you look at Tesla, again, you know, it was a first mover. It had a very uh, interesting business model going in at the high end and then scaling and then coming down into the lower end. It has obviously had a meteoric rise. You can decide whether or not you believe the valuations. Uh, I love the product. I don't know about the uh, investing in the stock, but uh, we're not, all we can say is this is obviously transformational if you can move. And all the other automotive companies are now having to respond to that uh, transition, that very, very short and meteoric rise. So the energy transition is already happening. So where does it fit within the broader set of ESG factors that we're, um, we're told we need to focus on? Well, firstly, ESG is important. If you actually ask consumers, um, then 62% of them say they want to um, deal with companies who have a strong position on ESG. They say that they will, 82% uh, of them are likely to recommend a brand after learning about its ESG plans. And 53% will take action if they don't see, if they uh, to complain, if they're disappointed by what they see from a company. 47% will walk away and 17% will never come back to that company. The ESG in general is on the CEO's agenda. And indeed, surprise, surprise, investors seem to reward companies that are rated better. And even if you look at the underlying uh, studies, you see that the linkage between being highly rated on ESG and financial performance of the business has a positive direct link. So you can see that doing the right thing leads to better performance, leads to being rewarded by the markets. So that already gets your attention if you're a CEO of a business. But ESG is a very broad spectrum. It has lots of things. In the environment, it goes from carbon, which we're um, focusing on, to anything from circularity, 
through to land use to uh, biodiversity. In social, it goes from human rights and labour practices to diversity, equity, and inclusion, right way through to cyber. And on governance, it again will go from the land of business governance, uh, transparency, and business ethics, uh, right the way through to tax practices and beyond. So 21 factors, they're not all, they're all important, but at the moment, they're not all equally important towards investors. If you actually look at analyzing activist investors, 28% of the time they are focused primarily on greenhouse gas and emissions, the carbon and energy transition. 11% labor practices, 11% transparency and risk management, 9% debt, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and 7% cyber. So there, there is a broad spread, but they are very focused. This is the core of what ESG means today. Now, obviously, as we address it more, the, the lens will widen, but this is such an existential crisis that we are very focused at the moment on the energy and carbon transition. Indeed, if you look at VC funding, you'll see that about half of it goes to either greenhouse gases or circularity. So the, the money is following the views of those activists, following the, uh, the priorities that we think are underpinning uh, business. And how does Ukraine affect that? Well, Ukraine has a dual effect. On the one hand, you want to double down on the energy transition because then you have a sustainable, low cost, secure source of energy if you have more fat. So the UK government announced increased hydrogen, increased uh, um, offshore wind targets to respond to the uh, crisis. On the other hand, we still have 33 million vehicles in the UK. 2% of those are electric in the UK. 98% are running on petrol. We can't have them stop. We have to heat the homes uh, over the winter. So we need to diversify our fossil fuel. So we have this dual thing. And if you look at the energy security strategy that was announced uh, from just one, you could pick the EU, you could pick any market. There's basically this dual um, priorities. Double down on the energy transition, which will make the tipping points happen sooner and faster and also diversify your sources of fossil fuels. So the energy transition is happening. It's a clear uh, number one priority within ESG. But what about how you need to think about this if you're a business or a country? What are the rules that you need to think about? Well, if you go back to the industrial revolution, okay, we went, this is pictures of on the left uh, uh, fields, on the right factories, uh, the UK, um, experience was a leader in the industrial revolution and it doubled its investment because of all that capital that was required to build the factories build the infrastructure the result of that was huge transition to the economy we went from a very agriculturally driven economy to a very industrial uh, driven economy but the rewards were a doubling in uh, labor productivity a doubling in gdp growth rate and 100 years of wealth Okay, so a lesson, you can decide whether or not you take it, but this is why the, the Prime Minister described this transition as the green industrial re revolution. It's an industrial revolution, again, where if you don't invest, you won't benefit. So this is from a national point of view, which is why the UK has been a very much a leader on this uh, discussion. And these transitions can happen fast. I mean, take the, the horse and the car, in 1900, Easter parade in New York City, you can see a whole set of horse and carriages and one car. 13 years later, no horses, only cars. So 13 years, a transition can happen. And actually, if you look at lots of uh, technological transitions, around 10 to 15 years, things can really move. We are targeting less than 10 to do the EV transition in the UK. But the warning for businesses is Kodak. Kodak, with a dominant uh, player with Fuji, in a $1.9 billion business in 1995, making film and processing film. Ten years later, there was a whole, it, the profit pool had got bigger, $3.7 billion. But that profit pool was not dominated anymore by Kodak, because Kodak didn't have many memory manufacturing and storage capability. So Kodak very accurately predicted the transition to digital photography, but went bankrupt in the back of it. So this is a salutary story for CEOs are saying, if a transition occurs, then you have a very significant risk. <coughs> what drives that? Well, let's look at all of the experience curves, the cost curves that we've seen 
across all the energy sectors. We've seen a solar panel come down. We've seen a wind farm come down. And wind in the UK four, five years ago was £115 per megawatt hour. It's now below £40 offshore wind. Onshore, probably £30, £35. Pounds. Our wholesale price before Ukraine was around 50 to 60 So we've gone from double the wholesale price to below the wholesale price in four years. You can see the same thing on back. The cost has come down steadily. Every time you double uh, production, you bring the cost down a fixed amount. If you bring the cost down, then the car that's dependent on those battery costs comes down in price. The tipping point will be reached probably between now and 2025. In the UK, we've set that target on the basis of that to transition by 2030 to high, hybrids only, no petrol and diesel, 2035, no um, uh, only zero emission vehicles. Last quarter, we went from 7% penetration of battery car to 16% in one quarter. People are moving. They're saying the costs, especially now, the cost of the, um, the running the car is so beneficial to move to an electric vehicle that they are outselling all the other petrol and diesel cars. So a look at another transition, just to give you the another data point. Here are a lot of famous brands that 10, 15 years ago, you would have uh, known and loved and used a lot. These are the brands that came through the dot-com, all new brands. So some of the existing brands, previous brands are still there. Blockbuster, clearly not. <laughs> um, there are new sectors open up with eBay through uh, online marketplaces, but a huge turbulence coming through a transition. So the digital revolution is still ongoing, or adding on top of that, the energy uh, and carbon industrial revolutions. And so what you're seeing across all of those sectors that we started with, you're seeing new players coming out, the Orsteds, the Teslas, the North Volts, the Beyond Meats, the carbon engineering, creating new sectors to remove carbon from the, end and uh, from the air and sequestrate it. But you're also seeing a whole load of incumbents fighting back. You know, Volkswagen has been very aggressive on its uh, um, uh, strategy to transition. You're seeing lots of uh, mining companies trying to prioritize the minerals that are needed. There's lots of investment that's going to be required. In the UK, we estimate 1.5 trillion pounds worth of investment will be required to make this transition. Now, from a government point of view, they say, don't want 1.5 trillion, that's a lot of money to spend. From a business point of view, 1.5 trillion that gets a return is a growth opportunity. So you can see which side of the uh, market we're going to respond to this. These companies are saying this is a huge business opportunity as well as a significant risk. It also hasn't escaped other players. I only had kind of Western uh, developed market pictures. If you went to China, you'd see in each of those really leading businesses across all of those sectors. Let's take BYD. It's come from nowhere like Tesla to compete because of the scale of the Chinese market. The same thing I could look at other markets, but there are going to be a lot of businesses striving to take over during this turbulent period, taking over those uh, market leadership positions. So this is core strategy for all companies, whichever sector, not just energy companies, companies right the way across the uh, economy. And all of those businesses have to do, to go back to Henry Ford's famous quote, which I'm not even sure he said, uh, which was, you do need to build a cheaper, better, faster force because you're, for now, we're dependent on fossil fuels during the transition. The UK plan has, has fossil fuels right the way out to 2050. We're not getting rid of them 2025, we're getting rid of them by 2050, according to the Paris uh, trajectory. In the meantime, we also have to imagine what's going to replace them. Imagine the car that replaces the horse on those New York cities. But we have to do two things, walk and chew gum at the same time. We have to be able to think about how we make our existing business really, really competitive and also imagine the future business. So that leads me to the final slide, just on the five things that we're talking to clients about during this transition. Firstly, that big issue around how are you going to make your existing business really your engine one, your existing business in your existing sector, what is the risk to that of this transition? And if you think you're immune, your uh, financiers won't think quite the same because they are on 
uh, task force and climate financial disclosure will make them assess how exposed your business is, and they will make their funding decisions based on that. And GFANS uh, coming out of Glasgow, the Glasgow uh, Financial Alliance for Net Zero, is a whole set of uh, businesses of 140 trillion uh, of investment saying we're going to focus on businesses that are um, making the transition happen. So that brings you to the second priority, which is there are lots of opportunities. This is a huge capital uh, tsunami passing through markets where there's big, big opportunities like Tesla, but across all different sectors. But not only do you have to make money today, you also have to be seeing where your money is going to be made in the future and your kind of engine too. And then you need to manage the brand transition. So from the point of view of your investors, your customers, your employees, and your policy and regulatory stakeholders, you need to manage that transition. And to do that, you need to organize to be able to deliver that. You have to think about, is this integrated into your business? Is it a separate business? How do you do this? All of these things, one to four, we had to do for the UK government. We had to think about which we are the third most fossil fuel exposed economy in the world. Uh, that $5 trillion is very fossil fuels exposed. So we have to worry a lot about what's happening to that in the interim. We have to know where we're going in terms of an economy. We have 100 years of um, storage capacity. We can sequestrate carbon. So we're going to do a lot on CCS. If we do a lot on CCS, we can do a lot on hydrogen because our economy is 40% hydrogen for, uh, gas driven. So we will need a solution, but we also have blue hydrogen, then green hydrogen to, um, to transition. So again, the hydrogen strategy you'll see is in number two. Number three, we have to have communication with all the MPs, with all the consumers, all the businesses. We have to get them excited about that transition. We have to think about that communication. And then number four, we have to have a governance process. We have to have a governance process the works right the way across all the departments, everyone in, every department sent their most senior people to the governance that we decided, designed. There were two cabinet committees, one on strategy, one on operations, to actually deliver this, this transition. <clears throat> and then the last final point was any board I'm uh, talking to, I always say, zero, if you add up everybody in this room, if we're going to be net zero, you all have to be zero. So the next question is, what's your carbon footprint? Do you know, your, if you're passionate about this subject, how can you not know what your carbon footprint is? And if you know what your carbon footprint is, then what's your plan to get to zero? And when? It doesn't have to be tomorrow. When the 2050 was the net zero point we set for the globe. But if you can't answer that fifth question, if you're on a board, if you think your employees will increasingly be able to answer that question, you better be able to answer it for yourself. Thanks a lot, Gillian. We already have uh, two questions over there. Um, yeah, we'll be limited to these three questions given the time, but uh, yeah, please go. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was very uh, inspiring. Um, some voices in some people, uh, very nickel about the ESG um, practice. There was a very good article in The Economist recently that was advocating for separating the E from the SG. So I would like to get your point of view on that. You know, some companies like Tesla, for example, seeing their ESG score going down because of governance issues, although they're doing a great job, obviously, on the environmental side of, of things. So I'd like to get your stance on that. I'm Maybe I'm a efficient market uh, view. In the end, uh, the more transparency and the more data we have, the more visibility we have over those 20 they're going to the ratings, the more we will be able to disaggregate and understand. I mean, to say that everything is going to be driven by a single act thing and that we're going to make a decision about how to calculate that is naive because obviously there will be arbitrage opportunities. I've just shown you data that says some factors are more important than others. So we need to weight the, uh, the factors in the short run. The medium run, those weights will change. In the long run, those weights will change. So having a single rating is a very um, you know, simplistic way of attacking Problem. What the question is, is there a business case for each of those 21 factors? I would argue there's a very strong business case, and the 2000 studies would say you can link very clearly each of those factors to business performance. And if you link it to business performance, that should link to 
um, share price performance and investor performance. The one thing that had been missing in the accounting systems is we did PL counting. We then moved on to PL and balance sheet accounting. We now need to also have risk in there. So, what is the risk of your business from transition risk and from physical risk, from climate and all these other factors? So, if you have a more sophisticated um, accounting system, there'll be more transparency. You'll be able to spot the bubbles. And this is a carbon bubble. Those bubbles are bursting very fast. And some businesses are going to suffer a lot as those bubbles burst. So my answer is really get specific um, and get into the detail. And you should be able to outperform if you are clever about how you use things. Don't use naive indices. Yeah. Um, yeah, excellent. Uh, excellent presentation. The question that I have is, uh, Kind of related to the industry, you you mentioned that there are some industries that are clearly front runners like energy, um, but then also that there are some companies that are having to transition. ESG, first ed, which was previously done, um, but then also some companies that have come up from a grassroots thing like uh, Northvolt or Tesla. And in your experience, in which industries are are laggards, but then also. Um, do you see any patterns with the performance of new players or uh, uh, performance of new players versus? So my bet on the, for your latter point, my bet from all previous uh, transitions uh, would be there will be definitely new significant insurgents that come out and take the pure players who just focus on that sector from the start and, you know, like Tesla led on, on that. But then there will be players who will make the transition faster than others, like Ersted. So Ersted and Tesla are an interesting two examples because they're one is you know old school and one is new school. So I think the answer will be a mix of those two. Um, it, if you start, you obviously start with a huge advantage if you have an incumbent relationship with customers on a particular topic. Um, and so in, in theory, it, it should be an advantage. But like Kodak, you might not... Uh, prioritize the um, skills and capabilities, you might have a different set of skills and capabilities that might not be suited to the, the new ones. <clears throat> if you're an automotive manufacturer, you manufacture automotives, the reality is that an electric vehicle is a lot simpler in, on the one hand than a, an old style internal combustion engine, but it's also, in Tesla's case and many other cases, much more digitized and connected. So you probably have the construction capabilities, <clears throat> I went around the, um, the Tesla factory, one of the, the strategy director of one of the larger automotive uh, companies, and um, he was in horror at the structure. Uh, you know, they just wouldn't do it that way. But Tesla was building them, and he wasn't. So, yeah, <laughs> you, you can uh, you can take your thing. So, I think a lot of the automotive companies have the skill set. The question is, will will they move fast enough to get to the other side? It's a very different business model. My uh, I'm an entirely electric vehicle household. We don't take them to garages for servicing. What's to service? Um, I don't go to petrol stations. You know, that petrol supply chain is going to uh, struggle over time when we get 50% on EVs. The, you know, the, the knock-on effects of the transition are really huge. You only need um, less brakes, more tires. <laughs> General rules. I'm very sorry we are not able to take all questions, so I'm going to take the last question and then move to our next uh, speaker. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, uh, to reach the net zero, we've talked a lot about technolog technological transition uh, and uh, basically sustainable growth, but I think we haven't maybe tackled maybe one of the most promising and short-term uh, way of, of reducing emission is basically um, uh, the, uh, sobriety. And uh, how do we temperature? Uh, do we temperate our consumption? And in any like IPCC model for now, uh, there is like a way to reach those objectives without integrating like widely uh, those sobriety targets. So how, as an economic leader and maybe as a, like a CEO as well, do we integrate those elements when some of, of those industries will have to decrease? For instance, we'll have to take less cars, we'll have to take less flights, we'll have to consume less meat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And as well, how do we adapt uh, our uses to the new climate reality? Uh, for instance, you talk a lot to, about Tesla. Uh, last week, they have stopped like few superchargers in China because of, uh, because of the extreme heat wave. 
So definitely we'll have like to to adapt and is, is there like um yeah, is there more like a balanced way of saying, okay, let's push some technology technological uh innovation, etc., and let's find some new usage, new narratives of how we live, maybe in like uh yeah, and new narratives as well. So the plan that we developed for the UK, which goes does go through all sectors in detail, it's 1500 pages. I highly recommend it to you for a bedtime read. <laughs> uh, so I had to proofread a lot of um it's a very very detailed plan and it it um but what it does not do is it, it attempts to have a growing economy a uh, wealthier economy more jobs and get rid of the carbon that's the objective that to me is the right objective because it's motivational to everybody we all all countries in the world should go around it there will be inbuilt into that some <laughs> consumer behavioral change Ultimately, the most extreme example of that is always airlines. Could we travel on airlines? It's a very small percentage of the problem today, but it's growing very fast. Um, and so you do have a question around, should we be flying less? And frankly, we've got a lot of technology now that means we shouldn't be flying as much uh, to do that. I came here on the train. I uh, have traveled mainly by train and by car for the last four years. So, um, but I have to go to some meetings, sometimes uh, internationally. The question is, are we going to technologically convert that plane or are we going to offset the last few percentage of emissions with proper, uh, fully validated carbon uh, offsets? Or are we going to change some behavior? I think it'd be a mix of all of it. And I think that's the right answer is a mixed answer. We are never going to be in the hair shirt. Yeah, we're not allowed to eat anything. We're not allowed to go anywhere. We're not allowed to you know, turn the light on. I think that's not the right answer, but equally the profligate lifestyle is probably right somewhere in the middle technology changes behavioral changes that will add up and our plan adds up so i highly recommend 1300 pages <laughs> yeah, right thanks a lot uh, julia So our next speaker, we are going from uh, consultant to consultant. And, uh, we have uh, Francesco Bellino, the uh, managing director and partner here at the Paris office of uh, BCG, also uh, leading the uh, French sustainability practice and the partnership with uh, Change Now, an uh, international uh, global platform uh, on sustainability. And uh, he will be uh, talking to us about ESG data and carbon uh, sorry, carbon footprint measurement. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Very happy to be there. As Matthias said, I'm leading the sustainability practice of BCG in Paris and coordinating our sustainability activities in actually what is my core industry, consumer goods and healthcare. Uh, over the past five years, uh, I spent most of my uh, working hours on sustainability topics, building on what you were saying, Ketel. I actually worked spend very little time with the chief sustainability officers. Uh, most of the clients I have that today are concerned about sustainability are CEOs, increasingly CFOs. As of today, I think now half of the projects I'm doing are with a CFO or finance heavily involved, uh, head of operations. Sustainability in a lot of companies is already need an expert pool, but companies, start to realize that it's not a sustainability team that can drive the transformation they need to have just to achieve net zero. And, and I will talk to you today, a bit less data than the brilliant presentation <laughs> by a Bain colleague, but give you a sense of what are really the issues we face when we work with clients on sustainability topics on climate and net zero. Uh, Try to keep it short so that we have a bit more time for the Q&A. Uh, maybe the first slides. Building on the question, your question on sobriety, by the way, is a question where uh, I work in consumer goods. I often have also from my clients. Uh, I think this slide is important to have in mind. We tend to consider that the degrowth or the GDP reduction is a choice we have to make to keep the planet sustainable might be true. One of the truths is also that the way we're managing things 
will have a significant impact on the GDP. I would say that if you look today at the figures, at the studies, here it's the IPCC uh, from the UN and so on, it is today forecasted that the way we do things will lead to a reduction of the GDP. Already 8% if we manage to keep the world in the 1.5 by 200 and, uh, 2100. My colleague said how much he believes in that and I think he's right. 13%, even 30% GDP reduction by uh, the end of the century if we stay in current paths of three, four degrees. Its future, uh, you were mentioning China. China published today the result of the production figures uh, for August. They are bad. They are bad because of COVID measures. They are bad because of the heat waves. In Europe, agriculture will lose this year 20% of its top line revenues because of the climate conditions. So from a corporate standpoint, the degrowth is even a risk that they have to manage today, a forecast. And then the question is, how do you do sustainable business in a world that because of the planet limits, boundaries, because of what we have already triggered, will face climate change and significant impact on the business. Now, in that context, uh, I tell you, you also said, I think it's important for you, and we can move to the next slide, to <coughs> you can be certain that you will be working a couple of years from now in companies that will have net zero commitments, and you will take a job and a leading job, honestly, in a much more difficult context than what I faced when I joined BCG 15 years ago. 15 years ago, we were discovering the topic. I would say that between 2015 and 2020, that was the exciting years of commitments. Most of the commitments companies have taken are for 2025, 2030, and then some net zero down the road in 2040, 2050. Most of the companies I know, Today, one of the biggest challenges they're facing is operationally. How can I reach the targets we set for 2025? For a company, 2025 is not even tomorrow, it's today, end of day, <laughs> and 2030. Uh, take food companies, agricultural cycles are two, three years. Uh, if they have not done what needs to be done by end of year today, they know that they will not be there in 2025. Even sometimes the commitments just don't add up. Uh, I will a bit out of the carbon, but if you take on plastic and recycled plastic commitments, you put together the commitments of all the big FMCGs of the world of the share of recycled plastic in their products by 2025, the Nestle, the Pepsi, the Coke, Danone, and so on. You add everything up, you basically reach 1.5 times the available recycled plastic that we will have in 2025. Some will have the plastic, some will not. And then we start to consume a lot of plastic, which is not the purpose. So one of the key challenges for the companies over the coming decade will be to deliver on what needs to be delivered and what they committed. Uh, and a lot of companies are more and more committed to that. If we focus on the net zero, which is today when it comes to climate, the key and core commitment that companies are taken uh, just on the following slides just to align on definitions uh, one of the challenges and you will see in esg is that when we talk about carbon neutrality about net zero definition are sometimes uh, a bit different from one place to another from people to another uh, the way we define it if we can move Anna. Thanks. I think it's gone. Yes. Uh, how do you get net zero when you are a company? Three steps, but actually only two. You want to get really net zero. The first one, most important one, is how do you reduce your carbon footprint? Two implications to that. You need to know what your carbon footprint is. I will get back to that. And then you need to know what are the levels that you can apply. 
And today, one of the biggest challenges that most of the companies you know face is that when it comes to the carbon footprint, most of the carbon they generate is actually not in the company. It's in the upstream or in the downstream operation. Uh, L'Oréal, company probably all of you know, when they say well, they want to reach carbon neutrality, the scope one and two, what they really own is 0.5% of their carbon footprint. Most of it comes from the upstream, agricultural uh, commodities, the chemistry, the energy. So when a company starts to think about abatement, fundamentally change the way you talk to suppliers, the way you lead your supply chain. So reduction is core. Uh, we talk a lot about compensation, removal, and I'll get to that. But as of today, all the different scenarios show that to be credible, even on a 2.5 reduction uh, trajectory, the industries at large will need to reduce between 60, 70% at least the carbon footprint in 2040, 2050 compared to today. Massive transition. And then the zero may never exist. And then the question is, how do you compensate the remaining emission uh, that were not possible to remove? Uh, in the end, something will be there you will need to remove to claim the net zero. And in the trajectory, that's where you see companies claiming already today net zero, while you reduce, you can start to more heavily compensate and then reduce the compensation as the need for compensation reduce. Uh, two types of compensation, the removal, uh, we'll get back to the trees, but it's basically planting a tree that absorbs the CO2 that your operations emit. Uh, and then there is something which is more Roughly, the avoidance claiming that because of you, a tree has not been cut. <laughs> uh, there are scientific definitions, but that's really the idea. So today, a lot of companies claim carbon neutral through the old scope, but actually with most of the real efforts here, whatever effort it means, to be net zero, it's a much harder game. Because you need to remove the CO2 uh, from the atmospheres. Now, when it comes to a net zero objective, as I said, you need to reduce, you need to compensate. We're talking about figures. You need to know what your footprint is. You need to know between 2020 and 2021, did you reduce your footprint? Did you increase uh, the levers you are using? Are they having an impact on your carbon footprint? And truth is that Companies today are extremely uh, equipped to face to these kind of questions. Maybe we can go to the next. Uh, in BCG, I would say that over the past seven, eight years, we have been developed, developing a lot what we call BCG Gamma, which is our data science uh, department. Very early, we put ESG at the core of what our gamma teams, our data scientists are doing, because actually, I'm an engineer by training and consultant for 15 years, so I tend to look figures, and then once I have the figures, we always find what to do. ESG is a mess. You have no accurate figures in most of the carbon footprint that you will see. And it's not to blame the companies. It's extremely hard uh, today to get a proper assessment of a carbon footprint. And truth is that if you also look at, if you look at IT, for instance, the level of investment of companies, um, IT tech and digital that they put on products enabling ESG, it's ridiculously low. Uh, most of the clients I have, even the first advanced one, use Excel, the carbon footprint, uh, and a lot of assumptions. So when we looked the, we looked last year at most of the corporates uh, we discussed to or we work with, and basically what we realized that they all have an Excel with the carbon footprint, I mean, most of them, but when it comes to really measuring uh, the carbon, 
not even 10% were doing that. So 5% uh, were taking, making decisions out of these measurements and only 1% were actually on a reduction trajectory that they could measure and assess uh, when it comes to the carbon footprint. You put that in front of the vast majority of companies that have taken net zero commitments and you start to be scared. Uh, and this is important because today, most of the executive committee members I talk with, uh, CFOs and so on, these are people who are used to make decisions based on figures. They see the importance of the decision that they will have to make from an ESG perspective to get to net zero and feel very badly equipped to make those decisions. Uh, <coughs> Next slide. Yeah, next slide. Next slide. Yeah. Thanks. Now, a bit of data, but you don't have to look at the figures. I think <coughs> the two key elements we bring when we work with clients on their net zero trajectories are really around facts and figures. Here you have some facts, which is basically, it's nice to say, okay, we will reduce uh, fossil energy, we will uh, use more uh, optimized equipment, uh, switch gas to biomass and so on. When you are in a company, all these levers have a cost. Uh, and, and this is something we always use with our clients, which is you can always be net zero. The question is how much it will cost uh, and can you fit the investment and the cost in the business plan of a company? So it's really around making sure that we're able to build what we call an abatement curve, which is really listing exhaustively all the levers of the carbonation in that case that are up, that the company can activate. And for each of them, putting the cost that this will have for the company to see basically how far you need to get and how much it will cost. Uh, building still on the question of sobriety, the good thing about this kind of representation is that you can start to really have a discussion with clients around already all the levers of the carbonation that you can activate and are actually money savers. Uh, economic crisis that is coming war in Ukraine is also helping on that. If you look in all the discussions around uh, energy savings and so on, a lot of companies already started for economic reasons. Uh, having a call of total energy and so on, calling for sobriety wouldn't have happened two years ago. Now they need because it's an economical issue. So bringing this kind of data is absolutely key. We have a fact-based discussions within a company around what is the real potential levels, what is the cost, what is the sequence of the carbonation, which levels by when, and now you fit it into the PNL. Second key success factors, and it's where we'll talk a bit about on the next slide, sorry. Uh, some of the solutions that companies need today is basically how you inject advanced analytics into the ESG and the carbonation. Uh, today, this is a significant chunk of the work we do at BCG with our clients. And again, don't try to give the figures, but the idea is basically to see you what in ESG, when you think tech, what the before, after should look like. And here it's a real example of a client, uh, beverage company, a lot of glass in its supply chain, meaning that when it comes to the carbon footprint, a lot of the carbon emission are related to the glass value chain, uh, which is quite carbon emitting as a, a material. <laughs> When we came to help the client building the reduction, the carbon reduction uh, trajectory, what they had was the traditional approach, meaning they had the quantity of glass they used, an emission factor, how much should you put behind glass, and it was in the baseline. When you have this kind of baseline, moving the production from India to the US, changing the <coughs> colors of the bottles, all the levers you could imagine to optimize the carbon, actually you don't even have the baseline to impact <laughs> it properly in it. So basically what we did was, okay, 
class quantity emission factors, how do you decompose it in really all the factors that will have an impact on the carbon of our value chain? And when you look into glass, of course, there is the type of material you use from limestone or silica and so on is not the same emission, the color, the level of recycled content, the energy needs of your suppliers, plus how you transport the logistic footprint of your glass uh, supply chain. And you end up actually with more accurate emission factors. And depending on what you choose as a model, you actually can be between 700 and 1200 kilograms of CO2 emitted uh, per ton of uh, glass produced almost the double. Once you start to bring these kind of visions in the company, then you can have a head of supply chain that start to think about where should I put my factories? You have a head of transportation who start to think, okay, how can I shift as much as possible there? How much can we gain? You start to even have marketing. You start to think, okay, can I change a bit the product, the color of the bottle and so on? And Today, bringing this kind of views is really a way to activate a company uh, around a net zero trajectory. On the up there, the line was only known by the sustainability teams. When you come that the granularity, supply chain, marketing, finance, and so on, start to work together on the company. And I very much agree with you. If you want to have real impact, go to the business and work with the sustainability teams. This kind of visions, I think it's key to build the reduction, maybe quickly just to end on the other side. Next slide, please. Anna, next slide, please. Thank you. Compensation is key. Uh, it's key for two reasons. And again, when you are in a company, actually also the compensation strategy is becoming very material. The first reason is the price. Uh, when you look today at all the studies around how much it costs to compensate one ton of CO2, today the reality is that you can buy certificate on the voluntary market for roughly between two and four dollars, which is ridiculously low. Conceptually, the market is at two to four, but no one believes that just by putting $2, you can offset one ton of carbon. So the market today is abnormally low. And I will get to the why. Uh, but what is sure is that it will go up. Uh, I've been working a lot with CFOs around carbon pricing, how you put a price on carbon in the company operations. The compensation most likely by 2030 will probably be somewhere near the $100. $100 per ton. I'm now working with a client where finance has been as one mission in the company, which is basically delivered to the market 30 basis point improvement of EBITDA year over year, and they achieve that. This kind of cost can then jeopardize the profitability of the company because it starts to become 1,000 times what they today put uh, in the compensation meaning that today CFOs are really taking the lead also on the compensation strategy from a financial standpoint. And today it's super hard to find from a reputational standpoint good compensation. So here, I think it's important to have in mind because it's gonna be expensive and the whole market is to reinvent because today it's not satisfactory. I see time is running by, so I guess next slide. Hello. Uh, but which is around important to have in mind. We talk a lot about compensation, what a good compensation uh, should be. But actually, I will skip it. We can go to the last one. This is a VCG style. I encourage you oh, to yeah, that's a good one. John Oliver exactly on the compensation. Very enlightening. Uh, two takeaways of the, of the three takeaways of the video. If you haven't seen it, it's super. It's very fun. It's very true. Uh, and it shows also how challenging it will be in the future for companies uh, to keep doing fluffy or untransparent things 
uh, reputation for the company when it comes on delivering on ESG objective will be more and more under scrutiny. Uh, some companies like Disney, uh, Nestle and so on are mentioned in that videos. This is a key issue also for the company you'll be working in. You will be under scrutiny on what you do on ESG and all departments will have to make sure that things are done correctly, fact-based and bulletproof uh, for reputation. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Francesco. Uh, we'll have only time for one question. So, uh, um, so you said that only 9% of the companies roughly have an overview of their system. I don't know much about the existing or emission certificates, but how does that work? How do those companies, like the 91%, participate in that system? The 9% is company that measure their carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. Most of companies today have built a carbon footprint, but which is largely based on assumptions <laughs> and not on measurements. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the 9% relates to the companies that have built the carbon footprints scope one, two, and three. Actually, most of the companies today have built scope one and two. Uh, the three is not mandatory. Uh, even at zero flame, it's not mandatory to be on the scope three. It will come in the coming years. But today, most of the footprints you see today are partial because only focused on the one and two. Great. Thank, Thank you. Good to know for people interested in BCG, they came with an entire uh, team sitting there in the back uh, <laughs> so to have a chat with them. Uh, I think they will be staying longer on campus. Ah. Um, so we are going to our uh, last speaker who is uh, calling in from uh, the States, I believe, uh, Laura Segafredo. Uh, she has a PhD in economics and is now working at uh, BlackRock. Um, so she will be talking about, to us about uh, climate science and also how to integrate it in uh, investment strategies and uh, in financial uh, products. So Laura, I'll leave the floor to you. Hi everyone, Hi. can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Perfect. All right, thanks so much for having me here today. Um, it's really a pleasure. Um, so I think that what I would like to do today in the next, uh, let's say 26 minutes, is to take you on a very short journey through some of the very basic elements of climate science. Uh, talk about the definition of a net zero economy, which I think we need to uh, clarify a little bit and why it matters to us both as humans who live on this planet, but also as investors. Um, so for our day to day job. So let me begin the story um, around 800,000 years ago. I promise uh, it won't take very long. Uh, 800,000 years ago, around the midpoint of the Pleistocene era, uh, about a half million years before Homo sapiens made its first appearance, so before humans in their current form. So us, our species, appeared on Earth. From then, through the start of human history, about 40,000 years ago, all the way until the dawn of the Industrial Revolution around the 1850s, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere has fluctuated within a very narrow band between 180 and 300 parts per million. When you see these numbers, PPM means parts per million. It's the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. Now, in the 1850s, at the very beginning of the Industrial Revolution, that level was around 280 parts per million. Today, uh, that level is around 415 parts per million. So remember, for all this time, 800,000 years or so, between 180 and 300, and today with the 400 at, four, at 15. Over this period of time, roughly 150 years, the world has warmed by about 1.1 degrees Celsius. Uh, and it's obviously on track to warm more, and I'll explain why. Now, what changed around the 1850s? What changed with the Industrial Revolution? Obviously, people began activities that release heat trapping gases into the atmosphere much, much faster than those gases can be absorbed by the atmosphere. One of the culprits of this was burning coal to power steam engines. And then those steam engines obviously uh, 
developing and evolving into combustion engines. And so, for example, cars today, or obviously power plants. Now, gases like CO2 are called greenhouse gases because they act as blankets. So they warm the planets, they warm the planet, they keep the heat in. And so uh, the human activities that I just described are the primary cause of the dramatic increase in global temperatures that we're experiencing today. So to slow and even stop further increases in temperature, the world needs to stop adding greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about transitioning our economy to an economy that is not so dependent on burning fossil fuels that add these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. It's also important to understand that even though greenhouse gas emissions began rising dramatically in the 1850s, so at the beginning of the, um, uh, at the Industrial Revolution, the increase has not been linear. And in fact, over the last 15, 20 years, it's been exponential. And over the last 15 years, the Earth has been warming at an equivalent of four Hiroshima atomic bomb detonations per second. So it's as if we were exploding, detonating four Hiroshima atomic bombs each second. That's the equivalent heating of the planet over the, 50, over the last 15 years. Now, as we all know, and this is all around us, and literally every time I talk about this, there's some new catastrophic event that happened that I can't mention. Just this week, it was the floods in Pakistan, but really all this warming is already causing major problems. There are more frequent and severe wildfires. We've all seen what happened, the US burning uh, and, and parts of Europe burning this summer, extreme droughts, extreme temperatures, tropical storms, loss of sea ice. I mean, we've had extreme temperatures in all the way in, uh, uh, in Siberia and in the Arctic, rising sea levels, um, and the loss of about two thirds of the Earth's wildlife, according to the World Wildlife Foundation. So we know, and we've been talking about it this morning with the previous speakers that staying on the current path will cause devastating problems uh, to vast swaths of humanity. Um, one really, really important statistic is that about 50% of the world's GDP, so what we measure to understand the wealth that we're creating on the planet, has a high dependency on services that are provided by nature. And so if 50% has a high dependency on services provided by nature and those services are extremely vulnerable to climate change, obviously 50% of GDP is very vulnerable to climate related risks. So that's a pretty significant number. That would tell me as an investor that that's something I need to pay attention to. At the very minimum, I can't ignore it. And then I need to figure out how to factor it into my investment decisions for the long term. Now, where do greenhouse gas emissions come from? The largest source of greenhouse gas emissions, about 75% globally of the global total of CO2 emissions, but even 90% in developed markets, so in places like the Euro US or Europe, about 90% comes from burning fossil fuels for generating electricity, for generating heat, and for transportation. The remaining 25% of emissions are from human activities in agriculture, um, land use, and also unfortunately deforestation. So cutting down forests produces CO2 emissions because obviously forests are so-called natural carbon sinks because trees absorb CO2 from the atmosphere. The most abundant source of greenhouse gases, more than three quarters of the greenhouse gases that are emitted into the atmosphere is carbon dioxide, so CO2. Uh, the second largest, about 15% of the total is methane. Because CO2 is the largest and hardest gas to reduce because it's, it's so intrinsically linked to how our economy is working. Um, and also because of how long it stays in the atmosphere. So CO2 has a so-called half-life of hundred years, meaning it takes about hundred years for half of it to be absorbed by oceans and trees, et cetera, in the <laughs> atmosphere. So it has a long half-life. Methane has a much shorter half-life, but a much, much stronger potential to heat. Uh, within the time that it stays in the atmosphere. Anyways, because CO2 is so hard to reduce because it's so intrinsically linked to our, the way that we, we basically function as a, as a global economy, and because it stays in the atmosphere longer, longer, we focus on that a lot when we talk about what needs to be done to mitigate climate change. But obviously all these other gases and methane is a really important one also matter. Uh, and there has been more efforts recently, including at the latest climate conferences in December in, um, in Glasgow to really come to some kind of an agreement about how to deal with that. 
Um, so that's that's uh, that's what greenhouse gases do and how long they live in the atmosphere. Now, one very important question is this. Um, and this, by the way, this is when we deal with sustainability, we always have to think about trade-offs. And, um, and so the idea is climate change is happening. And a very fundamental question is how much of that can we take? How much of that can we accept up to what temperature increase? And at the same time, maintain somewhat of a reasonable, uh, a reasonably um, wealthy global economy and healthy populations and avoid the, the, the worst of its, of its damages. And so that's been a question that scientists have had to grapple with for a long time, you know, since the beginning of the conversations around this. So roughly for the last 30, 35 years. So how much warming can we tolerate as humans before experiencing the most destructive and dangerous effects of climate change? And that's how that upper limit of two degrees Celsius, um, two degrees Celsius of warming above the pre-industrial average temperature. So above the temperatures up until 1850, uh, which is measured in the year 2100, by the way, that's how that two degrees threshold came to be. So this two degrees threshold was chosen a few years ago, and there's a long history about it, and it involves some PhD economists, unfortunately, that I think did not really understand climate science very well. Anyways, it was chosen mostly for political reasons than for true scientific reasons, but it has kind of stuck. And now we talk about two degrees. Uh, and we talk about two degrees and that upper threshold of temperature increases enshrined in the Paris Agreement, for example, that sort of landmark treaty on climate change that was signed in 2015. So now we're stuck with that, although scientists push for a lower threshold, for accepting a lower threshold of warming, meaning less climate change, because even two degrees obviously will cause a lot of disruption and a lot of problems in the world. So while there's some uncertainty about how much of a problem two degrees of additional warming will be and how we will be able as humans to adapt to it, um, I think that there's pretty much a universal agreement that the risks of deadly heat waves, of droughts, of flooding and mass extinctions will increase as our planet warms. I mean, we are, like I mentioned earlier, 1.1 degrees warmer today than pre-1850, and we already see this destruction around us pretty much every week. There's some news from some part of the world, and we can connect a lot of these catastrophic and extreme weather events today to the increasing global temperature because the science has gotten much stronger about it as well. So we observe this and we understand the origin of it being climate change and the origin of it being burning fossil fuels uh, to conduct our daily activities. So how can warming be contained to more manageable levels? That's really the big question. So that's where the Paris Agreement that I just mentioned comes into play. The Paris Agreement was signed in December 2015 by 197 countries. It's essentially all countries in the world bar a couple. This agreement commits the signatories to keeping the increase in global average temperatures to well below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and doing all that's possible to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. So that's why often when we think about the Paris Agreement goals, we talk about this range of temperature increase between one and a half and two degrees Celsius. That would be the sweet spot. The amount of warming that we're willing to accept uh, we should not go beyond that, but we probably cannot do less than that. So that's, it's really important to understand that climate change is baked in. Uh, and because these gases live a long time in the atmosphere, there's no reversal possible, certainly not within our lifetime. Now, under this agreement, and this is a really interesting part, and I'll just give you a little bit of history about it as well. The, the interesting part about the Paris Agreement is that it sort of broke a little bit of a deadlock in international negotiations. If you know you have been following this space, and I have been, I spent my entire career in this space, working at the nexus of energy and climate, and um, and. My, in, for a long time in my career, uh, it was very frustrating to see that all these efforts to uh, to find some kind of a globally coordinated solution, which would be preferable, we all understand, um, were essentially always timing and nothing ever happened. We couldn't move forward. Uh, one of the big sticking points is that there are different responsibilities in the problem that we're facing today, but at the same time, we're kind of stuck in this together. 
uh, different responsibilities because the countries that have developed first, the countries that have experienced an industrial revolution first, the countries that are today considered wealthy, developed countries with economies that are extremely fossil fuel based, they have a historic responsibility in terms of the cumulative amount of emissions that have been pumped into the atmosphere, which is obviously tremendous. And there are countries around the world, the so-called developing economies, that have not experienced that level of wealth creation yet. There are vast swaths of population around the planet. In fact, the vast majority of people do not live with the same standards of living as people in the developed world. And so there's a question of equity and fairness. Why should they uh, not experience the same level of, uh, of wealth uh, as the developed countries? Are we hindering their development by telling them that they have to limit their emissions? There's sort of that was part of the equation. It was, it was kind of treated like a zero sum game. But the really the merit of the Paris Agreement was that it sort of moved the conversation forward. And I think unfortunately, because we are experiencing climate change today, and it's pretty clear that well, everywhere, people everywhere in the world are going to suffer from it. So nobody's immune from it. Whether you have contributed more or less is kind of not even important at this point. Uh, what's important is what we do to actually <clears throat> solve this problem. And, um, and so the architecture of the Paris Agreement was one that uh, where each country would determine, plan, and report regularly on the contribution that it's making to mitigate global warming, on the contribution of the country to that global objective that is enshrined by that agreement. So in practical terms, each country has to come up with a plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And obviously it's expected that the countries that have more capacity to do so will, uh, will do things faster. So they will peak and reduce their emissions faster than countries that are still on a trajectory of development. So that's a really interesting part of it. And at the same time, the countries that are doing this first, in, think about the US and Europe, for example, will allow for technology costs to come down so that developing countries can afford to leapfrog the technologies that have caused these problems in the first place. So it's a really elegant solution. And it's certainly being possible because of the advancements and the cost reductions in technologies that reduce emissions. But let me talk about that in a minute. So how much of a reduction in emissions are we talking about when we're thinking about the objectives of the Paris Agreement? To discuss reductions, I think it's useful to think about the concept of a carbon budget. So a carbon budget is the cumulative amount of CO2 emissions that are permitted over a time frame to stay within a certain temperature threshold. It's a single number that encapsulates the finite limits that our planet has, our planet's physical system. And it also highlights the need to rapidly decrease emissions until they reach zero or almost zero. If we continue to release emissions beyond what the atmosphere can actually absorb, then the budget will be breached and then the Earth's temperature will keep rising. So we won't, we won't keep the temperature increase within that limit. Now, these carbon budgets are what's used to think about all the different scenarios and the pathways that we have ahead of us in terms of emissions. So there are a number of scenarios that are produced by climate scientists and by energy modelers. And I've done some of that when I was at Columbia and I worked on the deep decarbonization pathways project, leading that project um, for Professor Jeffrey Sachs um, that sort of culminated really in the architecture of the Paris Agreement. So there are a lot of these scenarios that chart these pathways to reach this goal of net zero emissions by 2050. Um, now, zeroing out global CO2 emissions by 2050, so zero CO2 or, or almost zero by 2050, would be consistent with a so-called likely, this is what the IPCC call it, likely chance of not exceeding the carbon budget associated with the two degrees Celsius increase in temperatures. By likely, they mean a two-thirds chance, so 66% probability of not exceeding two degrees of warming. If we are... Um, and at the same time, it would also be associated with about a 50-50, so as likely as not in IPCC speak probability of not exceeding 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming. So as you can see, there's a lot of probabilistic speak here. There's nothing, there's nothing certain, there's nothing deterministic, and we really need to be comfortable with probabilities and with ranges and, um, and <coughs> likelihoods of meeting certain temperatures within a certain error of margin. But that's really what climate scientists um, understand today. So there's a budget associated with a certain probability of meeting a certain degree of warming by a certain date. That's how we think about this problem. 
obviously this has been translated a little bit in a simplistic way with this concept of net zero by 2050, which I think is helpful in some ways, but also confusing in some other ways. Now, if we can't completely eliminate emissions uh, within this time frame of middle of the century, then, and this is the reductions in current emissions, then we also need to find ways um, to take carbon out of the atmosphere and, and put it somewhere and store it. Because again, it's about the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere that really drives temperature increases. Now, this carbon removal aspect can be accomplished essentially in two ways. One is by planting a lot of trees, but obviously there are limits to how much land we have and, and also trees burn and there's sorts of other, all, all, all other different issues like land use competing with food production. But there's also technologies that are being developed, although I'm not the bull, like I'm not really super yeah. bullish on these technologies because the scale is extremely limited today. Uh, there are technologies, however, that can take this carbon, capture it, so-called carbon capture, and sequester this carbon somewhere, whether in deep geological wells or even under the ocean. Some people have floated this idea. So eliminating these residual greenhouse gas emissions will also be important. It's like the net part of net zero, really. Uh, but I would say that the emphasis always should be on, on reducing emissions because that's something we know how to do, whereas we don't really know very well how to take carbon out of the atmosphere and put it somewhere. Um, so when we, when we paint this picture of net zero, I, I think that it's really important to understand, I often talk about how do we actually get there and what does the global economy look like in 2050 and especially the energy system. And so if we think about the fact that fossil fuels provide today about 84% of the world's energy demand, how do we net zero out this emission by still have a working economy? Well, we'll need to replace most of that energy supply with low carbon sources. So when I talk about this, and this is also part of the work that I had done in the DPP, I often talk about the four ingredients of decarbonization. So what are these four ingredients of decarbonization? The first is to drastically increase energy efficiency and resource efficiency. So how much output we can produce for each unit of energy input. And this is intuitive, obviously, because we want to be less wasteful because that's good for climate, but it's also good for the bottom line. Uh, however, the more efficient we become, the harder it is to further improve. And so that's when we get to the second ingredient of, of decarbonization, which is really, really important, which is electrifying everything we can. So every single final use of energy that can be electrified will have to be electrified. How we heat our buildings, how we transport everything, people, goods, etc. some industrial processes such as steel production, for example. At the same time, as we electrify everything, we obviously also have to decarbonize the power grid, meaning these sources of electricity have to be 100% carbon free. And so we need to deploy renewables at scale, deploy, deploy, deploy. These are technologies that have come down in cost so dramatically over the last decade, thanks to policies and also the scaling up of, of production and deployment and scale that today, Wind production, solar production are far cheaper than, than traditional coal power generation. They're about a quarter of the price of new nuclear, uh, and they are cheaper than new combined cycle gas turbines. So clearly, we've kind of caught a lucky break there, and the solution in the power sector is super obvious. And yes, we know these are intermittent. Don't talk to me about that. I've literally grown up in the power sector. There are plenty of solutions today for that, uh, but that's really the solution for the power grid. And then the fourth, the fourth ingredient is everything that you can electrify, um, you have to find some carbon-free fuels to really substitute for the carbon-based fuels. So for example, one option would be uh, to think about how to use hydrogen or some form of hydrogen like ammonia for stuff like ship shipping and aviation where you need a certain amount of density that batteries cannot achieve, at least not today. So that's the other, uh, the fourth ingredient. Now, achieving this end state of the economy implies a complete transformation of our energy and economic system. Not only that, in order to meet climate goals, it has to be completed within about three decades. I don't think that um, it escapes anyone that this is probably one of the biggest challenges and the biggest transformations that humanity has ever had to face. There's just no way to sugarcoat it. Um, this also needs to happen while maintaining current living standards in developed countries, like I mentioned earlier, but also <coughs> lifting millions of people out of poverty through energy access, increased incomes in the developing world, et cetera. And 
we are lucky in that some of the technical solutions to achieve net zero emissions today are commercially available. I was talking about the, the power <laughs> sector. Another obvious example is the electrification of private transportation, so electric vehicles, etc. But there are large swaths of, of industrial applications where we still don't have the solution, and that's where we really need to put money to really find what the next steps are and, and get the technologies on a cost trajectory that really allows it to be cost competitive and commercially viable and deployable at scale within three decades. It is really a gigantic, enormous challenge. Now, where are we along this path to net zero today? I think it's important to recognize that I've seen different faces throughout my career and it's been really interesting. I always joke about the fact that I'm used to being a contrarian because growing up working on climate and energy, I mean, I've had to deal with the fair share of people pushing back on all fronts. This either climate change is not real or if it's real, it's not human cause or if it's human cause, there's nothing we can do about it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I would say that the sentiment has shifted a lot over the past few years, and it's been really a pleasant surprise. However, the, the action has not really matched the rhetoric, and I think that that's where we are today, and there's a big gap to bridge there. Um, it's really interesting, I, and I think this is a really important statistic. If we had started mitigating uh, emissions, meaning reducing emissions, say around the year 2000, we would have just needed a 3% very gentle decrease year over year of emissions, and we that would have been sufficient to meet net zero in 2050. However, as we know, emissions have only been growing pretty steadily over this period, with the exception of some developed uh, countries. I mean, in the US and Europe, emissions have pretty much plateaued for over a decade now, which is good news. So that window anyways of the gentle sloping, you know, the gradual transformation has passed. That's not available to us anymore. If we started to reduce emissions now, achieving the goal of net zero emissions in 2050 will require a much more significant rate of year over year reductions of the order of seven to 10% a year until 2050. If we waited until 2030, we would need to reduce emissions by 30% a year. Now, let me just give you this point of reference. When the world shut down for COVID, so the entire global economy stopped, nothing worked. Companies, factories, no cars on the road, nothing worked. Well, that entire shutdown of the global economy resulted in a temporary drop in emissions of 20 to 30% for those couple months. Annualized, that reduction was about seven or 8%. So that's the magnitude of what we're talking about. However, the good news is that, as I mentioned earlier, technology has dramatically improved since 2000. So if we had started in 2000, we would have had this gentle journey, but it also would have cost a lot of money. Today, we can achieve those emission reductions with massively lower costs because these net zero low carbon alternatives are actually available at scale and they're cheap. And so the total mitigation costs to net zero are lower today, actually, than they would have been in 2000, despite that more gradual emissions reductions pathway. Um, I've already mentioned some of the statistics around the costs of, uh, of, elect of solar and wind, etc. Um, and so now we think that the climate mitigation scenario to net zero, we've done a lot of work on this uh, at BlackRock. And we've looked at what would happen if we don't do anything for climate and what would happen if actually mitigation happens. We focus so much on the cost of reducing emissions, and I don't think we focus enough on the cost of doing nothing on climate change. Um, we put a number around that and we, and with a very honestly um, sort of um, initial estimate, which is, which is not perfect because the models aren't perfect. And I can talk about economic models and how bad they are for a long time. But from a very sort of initial estimate, we think that a climate mitigation scenario to net zero would actually produce more growth, about 25% cumulative more growth over the next two decades than a scenario in which we don't address climate change. And I think that that's one of the most interesting findings of some of our recently published um, climate aware market, uh, capital market assumptions that we have put out. And we're revising this now. Uh, and I'm ex expecting this number to get even better possibly. And why is that? If you think about BlackRock as an investor, we are invested in the entire global economy. We have an interest in the global economy succeeding and uh, in, in sort of global prosperity more than we have an interest in one company succeeding over another or one sector perpetuating its ways over the rest of the economy. And so I think that aligning that kind of thinking with long-termism and the idea of being universal owners of the global economy, that's a really important point. 
However, governments are, I think, that are not doing really enough today uh, to get us there. And that's a really big issue. And it sort of opens the question of what the role of the private sector is. Um, there are more than 100 countries today that have committed to net zero. Um, the vast majority, I mean, 80 percent of the world's GDP and about even more so, I mean, 90 percent of emissions. So a lot of governments now have that ambition, how they will pursue that ambition. It will have to be a combination of policy options. It will have to be direct investments in infrastructure. It will have to be some with some form of carbon pricing wherever that's viable. And with the adoption of specific uh, regulations that address different sectors, like for example, performance standards for cars and buildings, but also through support of early staging technologies such as green hydrogen or the carbon capture and sequestration that I was mentioning earlier. But there's a big gap between these ambitions and the concrete plans because current government policies are expected to deliver even in their most recent ambition, meaning the uh, COP26 uh, in Glasgow, we're expected to be on a pathway somewhere between two and two and a half degrees of warming in 2100. So clearly there's a gap between the, the ambition and where we are today in terms of policy implementation. And that's something that we really need to think about and focus on, I think very urgently over the next few years. I'll also say before closing with sort of three takeaways that we very much think that this transition to net zero is happening. That's the view of BlackRock as a firm. We also think that despite all this, it's actually accelerating. And a couple of interesting examples from this year. This year, we've experienced a pretty dramatic conflict on European soil. And that what that has done, it, it has actually prompted Europe to more decisively move in the direction of investing in renewables and sort of trying to figure out how to deal with the dependence on fossil fuels, particularly natural gas. Through the Repower EU plan, which is a massive investment plan that will accelerate the deployment of renewables in Europe. At the same time in the US, in a very unexpected way, let me tell you, if I had this in my bingo card in January, I would not have thought that one of the most <laughs> interesting uh, accelerators of the transition would have been that the US would have passed climate legislation for the first time ever um, with a, a very difficult political situation here that will basic, that will pour something close to half a trillion dollars into uh, the deployment of clean technologies. That together with the, the infrastructure package that was passed last year and with the chips package and the, with the COVID recovery, et cetera, this is a massive amount of money that is going to uh, accelerate the deployment at scale of existing technologies, but also really importantly, the development of technologies that we don't have today or are not available at scale to solve some of those problems that we still don't know how to solve. And that's something that's really hard to model and we don't really know the effect it will have, but clearly between policy certainty and the idea that the US government is committed and spending a bunch of money on these things, that will have a really important catalytic effect, I think, in private markets and in investors, especially early stage, venture, private, et cetera, all the way before it gets to my world, which is the super liquid public markets, even before it gets to that world, there will be a giant amount of money allocated and moving in that direction. And that can only be good for climate. So three points I want to leave you with, and I know that I took the entire 30 minutes. First, this is the most significant technological and policy transformation in our lifetime. This is a warp speed industrial revolution. It's very exciting times. It's very exciting times to be working on it. And we need to really be smart about how we think about it. The second is that we have to pull all different levers to get to net zero emissions. There's no either or, uh, there's no either electrification or decarbonizing power or energy efficiency. We gotta do everything, including carbon capture, even if we don't really know how to do it. And then the third, which is related to that is we need to figure out how to eliminate these residual emissions from the system. And that's what negative emissions mean. And that's where we need to do a lot of work but really focusing on reducing the emissions that we know how to reduce in the first place. Um, let me stop there and see if there are any questions. All right, thanks, uh, Laura. Um, is there a question? Okay, um, so um, obviously you work for a very prominent asset manager and more working um, asset owners around the world, especially pension funds being pressured by uh, governments and society to uh, move away from investing into carbon heavy industries, oil and gas, for instance. 
uh, do you think that's the right ideas for uh, these asset owners or they should stay and more engage in sort of uh, shareholder activism? I love this question. Can I add something on this? Oh, yeah, quick. Uh, yeah, just to add, it was exactly my point. Uh, today, like the 10 big, I mean, 10 uh, largest investors in the world, so largest asset managers, uh, owns like basically half of the oil, coal, and gas uh, emissions in the world. So, how do you, you guys, as like a, uh, um, influential like shareholders, like try as well like to to influence uh, those companies that, uh, for instance, like uh, uh, mine coals or, or go to to look for petroleum. Yeah. So, okay, this is a big topic, and I, I love it, and it's been the focus it's of my career for a long time. So, let me just try and make some differentiations here. The first is that, um, as I said, this 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 transformation to net zero is a transformation, and it's a journey, and it's going to take three decades, which is a very short amount of time. However, our energy system today is 85% plus based on fossils. So then there's a real question around how do you actually power this transformation of the global economy from today to where it needs to be? Let me give you an interesting example. Uh, we have looked at a bunch of metrics across different exposures last year, and I think we're going to publish finally a paper. This is something that Trisha had already worked on when she was working with me, but um, the times to publish research at BlackRock sometimes can be pretty glacial. Um, so one of the interesting things is you look at a bunch of different metrics that can represent uh, how companies are performing against the transition. Traditionally, one of the things that people have looked at are carbon emissions, but there are more interesting ways to think about it, which is where is actually the company headed? How are they reducing their emissions? Are they aligned with the global trajectory? Are they doing better or worse than their sector is supposed to be doing under these scenarios, et cetera? Something I'm pretty familiar with. So then if you look at different exposures, you'll see that um, obviously, uh, you know, the, the, the picture for the global economy doesn't look great. When I say today we're on a trajectory to warm between two to and a half degrees, global capital markets pretty much perfectly represent that. Uh, so it's clear that companies aren't doing their part. It, it's clear that policy is deficient. But then you look at exposures like clean energy exposures. Uh, so for example, the S&P clean energy index. And then you look at that index and you see, okay, if I actually take forward looking uh, uh, measures, uh, I see that that sector is um, not in alignment with, uh, with the, uh, the trajectories that we need to meet global climate goals. Why? Because providing solutions to decarbonize energy today is energy intensive and that energy is carbon intensive. So if we were to withdraw capital from clean energy solutions today, we would reduce the carbon footprint of our portfolios. So the paper emissions that we have in our portfolios or the so-called financed emissions, and we, would, we could feel very good about ourselves, but we would also withdraw capital from those companies that are in the clean energy index that are actually helping and facilitating emissions reductions. Carbon reductions and the transition to net zero is a journey and Carbon reductions is carbon intensive. I know it's weird, but it's the way it is today. It doesn't have to be, and hopefully it won't be a decade down the line, two decades down the line, et cetera. So I would also like to make a distinction between, when I talk about the four ingredients of decarbonization, you haven't heard me talk about that energy in 2050 needing to be fossil. And that's the really big transformation that we need to actually affect. That power, everything has to be electrified and that power has to be carbon free. And then we have to find ways to do all the other carbon based fuels to get those without carbon. So in that equation, there should be no carbon, which means that some companies today whose business model is focused on extracting and selling those fossil fuels, they have to transform very dramatically. And it's not a coincidence that they have been the ones resisting this transformation. So it's a very different conversation when you're thinking about talking to power companies, gen companies that might have some legacy generation in some pretty dirty, polluting, horrible stuff like coal that have to transition to fully renewable because we need that electricity to power everything in 2050. So that's one conversation. And it's a different conversation when you're talking to the oil and gas companies that have to find some kind of an other viable business model. Are they pivoting towards doing offshore wind? Are they pivoting towards doing what exactly? Like it's unclear. And I think that we haven't figured this out and they haven't figured it out. But they are large players today, and they are big in capital markets, um, and they weigh a lot. 
And so I think that that's the conversation. Obviously, players like BlackRock have a very, very large teams that do engagement. We call it we call it stewardship. We talk to these companies and we really think about, so there's two things that interest us. The first is that we think that some of those businesses are risky inherently because if we are pushing carbon out of the energy equation and out of the global economy, those assets might become stranded. And that's the risk of my portfolio. So that's the first entry point. How do I mitigate this risk? And how do I work with these companies to make sure that they have a plan? So that's number one. But number two, then there are considerations around what our clients need and want. And some of our clients simply want to be exposed to everything because that's what they want in their portfolio. Some of our clients want to play a role in this transition. And then we think creatively and smartly about how we can provide an option for them to invest <laughs> in, in uh, companies that are actually doing something to, uh, to reduce emissions and to provide the solutions for that world that we need to be in in 2050. So th those are really all the considerations that we need to think about today. I think that the, the, and by the way, I think as the ethos of any ethos asset manager is to basically say, here's, here's a op here are options of different products that you can choose from. If you decide that you don't want to be invested in fossil fuels, that's a perfectly legitimate option, perfectly legitimate. We have worked with clients over many, many decades that wanted to stay away from certain businesses. Think about church pension funds that didn't want to be invested in weapons, for example. And so the examples like that are many, multiples, and it's perfectly natural and legitimate to say, I do not want to be invested in this. And we have products that do that. It's also perfectly legitimate to work with a client that says, I actually want to be invested in that business, but I want to be invested in the transformation of that business. And so those are the options that we're offering. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. So sorry for going a bit uh, over time. Uh, a quick word on uh, careers. Holly will be presenting what we are doing as the Environment and Business Club. Uh, and also Bain is also here, uh, the recruitment team. So just like BCG, you can uh, meet them after the session uh, to uh, discuss uh, if you want to. Um, also, we uh, would like uh, to thank um, the Hoffman Institute for helping us uh, with uh, organizing this summit. Uh, and thank everyone in the Environment and Business uh, Club leadership uh, some of them are here, some are even following from Singapore right now uh, for uh, yeah, all the work they did to make this happen. Uh, and of course, we thank you for being here and the speakers as well for uh, making free some time to uh, come to us and discuss about our insights. So Holly, I quickly give the uh, floor to you. Uh, Anna, uh, could you please, please uh, put on the slide? Great, thanks. Okay, love it. Beautiful. So I won't take too long because we are just wrapping up, but this is the moment where I can launch our new uh, sustainability careers page to all of you. So if you can, if you want to find out more about kind of both inspiration or information about different career paths, then you can scan the QR code on this page. And we've we've kind of done the first step of collating the best of the resources that we've found so far. But we also really want to start collating all the knowledge that's in this room. Because what we haven't, what we felt as 22D starting was that we didn't really have kind of the best of the best of the people who had left. So we started that process. We really want inputs from you all. So the things that we've started with so far is we've got a list of the electives that we have and kind of links out to the resources. Just so that's all in one place. So if you're early in your career in INSEAD, you can figure out what to elect into at, at different times. Um, you can find out more about the club and kind of who to reach out to from the club leadership. We've got information about ISPs or uh, independent study projects and an example of a past ISP within sustainability to give you some inspiration if you want to use your credits for that. And then the last one thing is that we have um, some 22D career stories. So classmates that you may, some familiar faces from today from both Poti and Sing Singapore, uh, just to show what people were doing before INSEAD, how they found their journey. It's kind of quite honest. People have talked about what's what went well, what not so well. And you can kind of hopefully take some inspiration from there. So yeah, please scan and get involved and let us know if you have anything to add to those pages. Perfect. Thanks a lot. So yeah, so Holly is our career rep here in uh, Pompey. Uh, and in Singi, we have uh, for the people on Zoom, uh, Mingi, uh, who is uh, Holly's counterpart over there. So feel free to reach out to them if you have ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.